Welcome to Le Grand Voyage with Chateau Malartic La Gravière. In 1855, 19 of the most successful businesses in the United States were railroads. Another four were banks. One was a canal company and one operated gas lights. The American and British economies look very different to what we see today. But 165 years ago, the US and UK economies were still far ahead of France. Those railroad companies in the US had installed more than four times as many miles of railways as the French had. But France had a new emperor and he was determined to catch up. The emperor was Napoleon III. He'd returned to France from London, where he'd been in exile. During his enforced stay, he'd had an affair with an actress and with an aristocrat, and he'd plotted his comeback in the cellars of the city's most fashionable wine merchant, Berry Brothers and Rudd. Today, you can still see the cellars where he hid from the Chartist rioters in St James's Street above. Napoleon III returned to France, determined to modernise the economy. Among his innovations and plans was a fair, the Exposition Universelle of 1855. It was an international exhibition to be held on the Champs-Élysées in Paris from May to November that year. The emperor demanded that the finest wines of Bordeaux should all be on display and that they should be ranked. The job of ranking them was given to the region's wine brokers. Amongst themselves, they ranked each wine according to its chateau's reputation and its trading price, which they used as a sort of proxy for quality. Wines were ranked in importance from the first growth down to the fifth growth, or crew. All the red wines on the list came from the Medoc region of Bordeaux, all except one, Chateau Haute-Briand in Grave, just up the road from Malatic la Graviere. In 1855, white wines were considered much less important than reds. Plus à change, it's the same today. The only ones that made the list were the sweet wines of Sauterne and Barsac, and they only had two classes. It was an extraordinary piece of work. It kind of gave structure to the region, and the classification helped wine lovers understand Bordeaux and where its wines sat too. It was a snapshot of a moment in time for an industry in change. Except it's never changed. Not really. If you think about it, in the late 1850s, the largest company in the US was the Northern Pacific Railroad Company. Today it's Apple. The Atlantic and Pacific Railroad Company has been replaced by Amazon. The Southern Pacific Railroad Company was, if you like, the, the Microsoft of its time. But the 1855 classification hasn't changed nearly so much. In fact, it's only changed twice, and hardly even then. In 1856, the year after it was conceived, Campbell was added as a fifth growth. Nobody's quite sure if this was an oversight from the year before or a bit of an afterthought. There was a more substantial change in 1973. That was when Chateau Mouton Rothschild went from second growth to first growth. This was after decades of intense lobbying by Philippe de Rothschild. The third but less well-known change, if you like, was when Chateau Dubignon, it was a third growth from Margot, was absorbed into the estate Chateau Malesco saint exupéry That effectively meant it disappeared. The only other difference between today's list and the 1855 original is that in 1855 just five of the estates called themselves Chateau. Today most Bordeaux wine estates are called Chateau, but they're exactly the same places. The 1855 classification is the most famous in Bordeaux, but it's not the only one. The wines of Grave were classified in 1953. It includes both red and white wines, and Malatic La Graviere is one of just six that received classifications for both. In 1955, there was also a classification of the wines of saint Emilion, but this one is renewed every 10 years. What's remarkable about the 1855 classification is it shows us how wine is timeless. Sure, there are issues with it. It ranks wines by estate, not by vineyard site. Classifications pass as the estates go from one owner to the next. There are some obvious issues. There are chateaux who should be higher and times when estates should have been lower. But that also means we're talking about Bordeaux, we're debating it, thinking about it. And there's a sort of hidden genius in that too. Join me again tomorrow when we'll be talking more about Bordeaux 
with Le Grand Voyage. See you then. Thank you.